Here's a, another experiment um, showing much the same thing. Um, in this experiment, and this experiment is by my ex-student, um, Laura Schultz at MIT, here's what they did. They took our Blicka detector, um, and then to begin with, they showed that, uh, but instead of having blocks, now they had pop beads on the detector. You all know about pop beads that stick together. And what they did was first they showed the children either that all of the beads made the machine go, or that some beads made it go and some, made, some beads didn't. And then what they did was they gave the children a pair of the pop beads stuck together, um, and they put the pair on the machine, and the machine lit up and played music. And then they just left and let the children play with the machine and the beads. Um, now, here's the interesting question. What would the children do? Well, in this condition, the all beads case, there isn't really anything much that you, uh, you already know that both of the beads are going to make the machine go. But in this case, there's a real problem to solve, which is which one of these beads is making it go? Because you already know that only some beads make it go and not others. Is it both of them? Is it just one? And what they discovered was that the children um, in the some beads condition would pull the pop beads apart and try them separately just in the course of their play. And they didn't do that in the all beads condition. So in other words, just in their spontaneous play, they would do the thing that would be the right thing to try and solve the causal problem. Um, then they did something, the experimenters did something even trickier. They actually glued the two pieces together. Um, and what they found was that in the some beads but not the all beads condition, the children did this. They took one end and tried it, and then they turned it over and took the other end and tried it. So they had an even more ingenious way of trying to solve this problem. So again, this is just the experimenter walks out of the room, just lets the child play, get into everything, as we said. But the children are actually being very sophisticated about figuring out, here's what the problem is, and here's the information that I'm going to need to be able to solve the problem. Um, let me give you another example of this kind of, uh, this kind of exploration. Um, and I'm not going to give you the whole uh, a video for this. I'll just tell you about it. This is also by my uh, postdoc and, uh, and student. This time what they did was they gave the children this new toy that had four interesting things it could do. It could squeak, there was a light, there was a mirror, there was music. And the experimenter came in and in one condition what she did was she said, oh look, this weird toy. I don't know anything about this toy. Look at this strange toy. She bumped into the toy and the squeaker squeaked. And she said, huh, look at that, the squeaker squeaked. She pressed it, it squeaked. She said, okay, I'm going away, I'm going to let you play with the toy. Well, what most of the four-year-olds did was they played, they experimented, and they figured out all the possible things the toy could do. They found all the hidden possibilities. In the other condition, the experimenter said, this is my toy, I'm going to show you how it works. So in other words, instead of acting as if she was clueless, she acted as if she was a teacher. She said, this is my toy, I'm going to show you how it works, and she pressed the squeaker. Well, then, all the children ever did was press the squeaker. Um, and in fact, they pressed the squeaker over and over and over again. They didn't find any of the other things that they could have found. Um, and the point of this experiment, and we have experiments like this in my lab as well, is children, even four-year-olds, are very sensitive to whether someone's teaching them or not. And when they think that someone's trying to teach them, they narrow that range of possibilities to fit the thing that the teacher is telling them. So there's a kind of double-edged sword to teaching. It means that you can get to the solution the teacher wants faster, and even four-year-olds are sensitive to that, but it also means that it may restrict the possibilities that you consider and your capacities for broader exploration. Okay, so far I've been talking about how children um, so far, I've been talking about how children solve physical problems, figuring out how toys work or how blicket detectors work. But one of the things that's most important for human beings is to actually figure out how other people's minds work. Um, and again, from a philosophical perspective, this is a great philosophical problem. Um, so if I look around this room, what I actually see are a bunch of bags of skin that are stuffed into pieces of cloth and have little dots at the top that move back and forth and holes that open and close and have noise coming out of them. But of course, that's crazy, right? I mean, nobody actually sees the world that way. Instead, we see people with thoughts and beliefs and desires and feelings, people who are a lot like us and people who have minds that are a lot like our minds. 
and trying to figure out how other people's minds work is a very, very challenging problem. And over the last 30 years or so, we've discovered that um, even young children are working very hard on that problem. It's maybe the hardest problem that any of us ever have to solve. Um, now, again, as I said, the traditional wisdom was that children couldn't solve that problem at all until they were well into the school age years. So people would say that children were egocentric or they couldn't take the perspective of another person. We thought maybe that was because we weren't asking the question the right way. Um, so what my student Betty Repicoli and I did was to give the children two bowls of food, one bowl of raw broccoli, one bowl of Pepperidge Farm goldfish crackers, and even in Berkeley, the children all really like the crackers and really don't like the broccoli. Um, my books have been translated now into 30 languages, and I had a wonderful correspondence with the Italian translator about this, because first we had to explain why do American children like to eat little fish, which seemed really strange. And, and there's this place called Berkeley where they like to eat things even though they don't taste good because they think they're healthy and the Italians just couldn't understand it, so we just left it out of the Italian version. <laughs> anyway, even though the children all like crackers, well then what they, happens is they see the experimenter take a bit of food from each bowl and she acts as if she really likes it, so she goes, mmm, broccoli, I tasted the broccoli. Or she acts as if it's really disgust disgusting, she goes, ooh, yuck, broccoli, I tasted the broccoli. Half the time she acts as if she has the same preferences as the babies, she likes the crackers. Half the time she acts as if she likes the broccolis. Then what happens is we simply give the babies the two bowls of food and the experimenter puts her hand out and says, can you give me some? Now, the question is, what will they do? Will they choose to give her the crackers, which is what they like, or will they realize that she likes something different? Well, it turns out that 18-month-old babies will give her the crackers if she likes the crackers, and they'll give her the broccoli if she likes the broccoli. So these little children already seem to have realized something which is kind of hard for the rest of us to realize, which is that sometimes people want something different from you, and also seem to have the impulse to try to help people to get what they want, even when it's something different from you. Um, this is amazingly sophisticated knowledge in these 18-month-olds. In some ways, just as interestingly, the 15-month-olds didn't do this. So the 15-month-olds looked at her for much longer when she acted as if she liked the broccoli. But then they just gave her the crackers. <laughs> so, so not only had the, did the 18-month-olds know something very deep about the human condition, but they also seemed to have learned it between the time they were 15 months and the time they were 18 months. Mm -hmm.